Back in high school, I weighed a whopping 86 pounds, sopping wet. I had a dilemma. I was skinny, really skinny. <laughs> I know, right? Oh, yeah, I know. How, how skinny was I? No, I'd like to address that. Just hang on a second, fella. Oh. oh, I got it. Back in high school, I was so skinny that if there was a shirt hanging in my closet back then, hanging on a hanger, and if I reached into the closet and took out said shirt and put it on, now what was inside the shirt, now that I had it on, was going to be roughly the equivalent of what had been inside the shirt when it was in the closet hanging on a hanger. Okay there, fella? Yeah, I was that skinny. Really skinny. <laughs> I was like that old joke. If I had turned sideways, the teacher would mark me absent. And I tried everything to gain weight, but those were the olden days. There wasn't anything, so I ate like a horse, and I could really pack it in back then. But for all of my high school years, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior year, I weighed exactly the same thing, a whopping 86 pounds, sopping wet. It's called metabolism. And yet, despite my shock and embarrassment of being nothing more than skin and bones and acne, I still had friends. And so, every Thanksgiving that came around, I had a standing invitation to four Thanksgiving dinners on Thanksgiving Day. Now, hold on, I have a mixed bag about Thanksgiving like everybody else. But while I was in high school and struggling with my 86 whopping pounds, I had a standing invitation to four Thanksgiving dinners. One at 12 noon, another at 2 o'clock. At my house, we ate at 4. And at 6 o'clock, my two best friends, Jimmy and Dave, that's when they ate at their house. So every single Thanksgiving that came along while I was in high school, I would sit down at table and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat and eat more and some more and even some more and more. Even it kept on until finally I couldn't stuff so much as another olive down there. And then the day after, I would go and step on the scale to see how much weight I gained. Only. The same number just kept coming up. A whopping 86 pounds, sopping wet. But it would be over at Jimmy and Dave's, my six o'clock, where I would meet my very first Uncle Clyde. Now, I told you that story in order to tell you this one. I am absolutely certain that every single one of you Either you already have had the burden of an Uncle Clyde in your life, or <laughs> you will have the same kind of personality type just keeps popping up. You'll have your own version of Uncle Clyde, who's coming up in a minute. And then some of you currently, I know, I feel for you, you are already enduring your own version of Uncle Clyde. <laughs> now, let me give you a little backstory now, okay? I'm seated at a harvest table that seats 25. Huge, right? Gigantic floral arrangement in the middle. Every kind of Thanksgiving fixing that you can 
think of out there, you know, forget about it. The holiday ham, roast turkey, stuffing, the mashed potatoes, the sweet potatoes, the, the corn on the cob, the sweet peas, everything, all right? Four kinds of dinner rolls, two kinds of salad. If you wanted Italian, they were serving a lasagna that was this thick. Spaghetti meatballs on the side, over in the corner, the little children's table, right? Just about a foot and a half high with these teeny tiny little chairs. All these little toddlers with their cone hats and the elastic with the fluffer nut thing on the top. Grasping their, their big fat plastic spoons and knives. Wouldn't stop laughing, throwing food at each other. Now, Jimmy and Dave, Jimmy's my best friend. He's 16. Dave is his younger brother. He's 14. And Dave has just gotten his very first part-time job. That fall, started as a kind of like a bag boy cleanup aisle nine fella in a supermarket. And Dave is making very acceptable table talk about how, well, he's spending his own paycheck now. His own money. He's even got a modest little savings account down the local bank. And how all this, he's keeping up with his classwork and his homework, and he's, he's getting his good grades, the same as usual, okay? He's talking about how managing all of this responsibility is making him feel like, you know what? He's really starting to grow up, join the adult commu community, excuse me. And here's where Uncle Clyde chimes in, all right? Ladies and gentlemen, Uncle Clyde. <laughs> Responsibility? Dave, did I just hear you use the word re response, response, responsibility? <laughs> responsibility, Dave. <laughs> you don't know what you just said, do you? <laughs> it's not that it's the longest word in the English language. Yeah, it's got 13 letters. But it's what ultimately kills you and puts you in the grave is responsibility. <laughs> you kids, you kids. Responsibility? Why, when I was half your age... That would make Uncle Clyde aged seven. Both of my parents died, and I had to look out for my crippled sister. Had one leg shorter than the other. Needed an operation. We didn't have any money. So I went out to the woodpile and whittled her a pair of clogs. With one of them... This much higher than the other. In order to accommodate... Hey, shut up down there. Shut up. That's not funny. That's not funny. You kids. You kids. You know how many fights I had to fight? With every... Asinine, wise mouth. They called her Cloggerhead. And get... I said shut up down there. That's not... This is not funny. Shush. You kids. You kids. What what are you doing wearing bones in your noses? Giant safety pins in your ears? What the hell's the matter with you? And if I've got to look at just one more older woman's butt crack, lifted and separated from bottom to top by some kind of miracle weave spandex shapewear technology with control top, Aunt Louise... Jimmy, Dave, listen up. On a younger woman. A very much younger woman, Aunt Louise. Well, yes. That's a delight. And in her prime, she ought to show it off. But on an older woman, that sagging old rear end of hers, held together by secret stitches in modern techno weave. <laughs> Let me tell you something, boys. <laughs> I know what that's like once we strip all that away. <laughs> Avalanche! <laughs> it's a cave-in, boys. Run for it. <laughs> yeah. Jimmy, Dave, listen up. One last thing. That's another prime example of how the fruit 
doesn't fall very far from the tree. And the embarrassed silence around that table was so thick, you could have cut it with a knife. I'm not kidding. And the situation itself was literally screaming for some kind of comic relief. And being the, the fledgling wise ass that I would ultimately become, I simply couldn't resist. So with a quick assessment around the table, I formulated my plan, slammed both hands down on the table so much that I rattled the crockery. Bam! And I looked up at Uncle Clyde. I said, Uncle Clyde, that was just inspirational. Will you say grace? And he turned on me with a glaring stare that was like a weaponized laser beam enough to bore a hole in the hull of a Cincinnati class battleship. And I confess, <laughs> I quailed. I felt like I was going to fold up inside like one of grandma's lawn chairs. Then I looked across the table at Jimmy and Dave, trying to contain themselves, sniggering up their sleeves as it were. And this just emboldened me. It's like pouring a bucket of gasoline on a campfire. I just couldn't resist. So again, I assessed quick assessment around the table, formulated a plan. I stood up so abruptly with the back of my calves, I knew how to do it back then. I pushed my dining room chair back across the screech of the dining room floor. And I grabbed my glass of water and I quickly raised it up. So fast, I splashed water all over the ceiling, all over the guests down that end of the table, and I proposed a toast to Uncle Clyde. May he never have to view an older woman's butt crack again. Responsibility! And it, the last bit of water went flying out of my water glass all over everybody. And then something happened I really wasn't counting on. I was just trying to crack everybody up. But very slowly, very solemnly, one by one, everyone around that table lifted their glass. And if they didn't whisper it, they uttered it with articulate volume. And they all said together, responsibility. And then we all took it a sip. And slowly and quietly, the murmur of conversation began to rise. And it rose and rose. Until finally, in time, it was the din of normal dinnertime conversation. Everybody and the rattle of crockery and the sound of spoons and knives and people talking and yammering away. Uncle Clyde had left the table. He'd gone off behind the garage to smoke one of his smelly old cigars. So Aunt Louise had come out from hiding in the kitchen and sat down next to her sister Ginny. And that was a remarkable Thanksgiving after all. I went home that night, went to bed, got up the following morning to see how much weight I gained, stepped on the scale, only to discover same old number came up a whopping 86 pounds sopping wet
Now Destiny was playing cards with his buddy fortune. Well, the boss had a hand exceeding table stakes. And the powers that be cut a deal with Lady Luck and Fate. That fortune must pay him the penny that Destiny takes. If we only believe That very day A man appeared in the doorway Of that little cafe And she greeted him with courtesy And faith When he looked in her eyes He said, darling, I've come to take you Away from this place When she asked him his name He replied just call me Ace. Oh, the powers that be, they're watching over you and me. Still got a trick up their sleeve. If we only believe. Twenty years have gone by, and she has never regretted a second. By how everything changed from the moment adventure beckoned. Now from dawn until dusk every day, she has everything it takes. And all over the world she is simply known as the face. Whoa, the powers that be, they're watching over you and me. Still gotta trick up the sleeve. If we only believe Now in a little cafe Just a half a mile north of the border At a quiet little table In a dusty, darkened corner Fate stealing cards Lady Luck is looking over His shoulder And fortune must pay Every penny that destiny takes Yes, fortune must pay every penny that destiny takes. I want to take you back to the 1960s now. The London sound, not the mercy beat, that came later. Songwriter by the name of Donovan Leach, otherwise known as Donovan, who would achieve fame and fortune with songs like Jennifer and Mellow Yellow. But this was side B of a single that went absolutely nowhere. I've always loved it. Well, I'll buy you a Ford Mustang. I'll buy you a Ford Mustang. I will buy you a Ford Mustang. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of your love. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of that. Love. Well, I'll buy you a diamond ring. I'll buy you a diamond ring. I will buy you a diamond ring. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of your love. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of that. Well, I'll buy you a Cadillac. I'll buy you a Cadillac. I will buy you a Cadillac. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of your love. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of that.
I don't want no Cadillac, even though it's shiny and black. I don't want no Cadillac. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of your love. Just give me some of your love, baby. Just give me some of that love. Yeah, I drink liquid rust for breakfast. I mix it in with gasoline. And then I chew on old men's bones for lunch, baby. Yeah, I grease them down with Vaseline. And what I eat for dinner. Whoa, bounces round like a trampoline. I got a junk food diet, baby. Whoa, worst case I've ever seen. Yeah, it's worse than sugar, baby. It's worse than caffeine. It's even worse than smoking, baby. Ten times worse than nicotine. It's those polytriglycerides and that. BHT. I got a junk food diet, baby. Ooh, worst case I've ever seen. Tried to kick it more than once or twice, baby. I just could not get free. Then I had me a blood sugar crisis, baby. In the end, it nearly took me. Then came my hour of decision. I had my junk food diet. Heebie weebies. Heebie cheebies. Oh, yeah, that's right. I got a junk food diet, baby. Ooh, worst case I've ever seen. Well, back in my little hometown, there ain't much doing and much to look forward to, ever. So when the prettiest girl in there about agreed to go out with me on a Saturday night, I was necessarily pretty tickled. I got all dressed up in my best suit, shined my shoes and put on my designer tie, and took her out to the cinema, and afterwards we went to Sims Right on Main Street. Now, after two hamburgers, I was feeling my 
be encouraged, so I asked her out for another date. When she looked at me right in the eye and laughed and said, I wouldn't go out with you again for a million dollars, you jerk. I went home, I was so upset, I sat down at the kitchen table and ate a whole gallon of ice cream. But later on, I was still so mad about it, I couldn't calm down. So I went out to the barnyard in the middle of the night, where suddenly I spotted my good old John Deere tractor there inside the barn, gleaming in the moonlight. I climbed up in the driver's seat, brought that baby up, slammed it first gear, and drove on out the gate. I'm singing tractor, woohoo, tractor. I'm driving all over the hills of Kentucky, singing tractor, tractor. I'm driving all over the farm. Well, I knew I wasn't getting anywhere, so really. The following morning, I went into work all foggy-eyed and weary. And the first thing that happened to me was the boss caught up with me before I could get to the line. He said, son, you're fired. I said, that's okay. I hated this darn job anyway. So I went home, and there's a stack of bills sitting there on the kitchen counter. And there was another gallon of ice cream in the freezer, too, so pretty soon I polished that off. Now it got to be the middle of the afternoon and nothing to do. So I went out to the barnyard again, and who you know it? There's the key to that old tractor. It's just a dangling there, a hanging on the peg. I'm singing tractor, woohoo, tractor. I'm driving all over the hills of Kentucky, singing tractor, woohoo, tractor. I'm driving all over the farm. Well, I knew I wasn't getting anywhere, really. So I called up my cousin Lester on the telephone. He's the smart one in the family. And I told him all that was on my heart. And after I spilled my guts for what seemed to be about a half an hour, he started yelling at me. Told me to get a life. Then he hung up. Oh, and uh, folks, I guess you all figured out by now that you don't have to be a metropolitan opera trained singer enough to carry this dinky little tune. So if you want, Join in on the chorus. Here she comes. Get ready. I'm singing tractor. Woohoo. Tractor. That's it. I'm driving all over the hills of Kentucky. Singing tractor. Tractor. I'm driving all over the farm. Oh, that was just terrible. Come on. All right. Not bad. Better luck next time. Well, I knew I wasn't getting anywhere, really. So I turned the key off right where I was. And I looked up at this big blue sky overhead. It was about 3 o'clock in the afternoon with those big puppy clouds floating by. Now, I admit I'm a big, strong guy, but I put my head in my hands. And I thought I was going to cry. When suddenly it occurred to me that I didn't want another date. I want to be a gal and a pretty one, too. And I wasn't going to need another job, man. I was going to need me a, a whole darn company. And I don't... I don't... I don't need to call up my cousin Lester on the telephone and tell him my life story. I needed to rope him in and get him to run the factory. See, this how he's a smart one in the family. Well, shoot! If I'd only do that, all these here problems of mine it wouldn't add up to a, a hill of beans. And the whole earth stood still. The lightning flashed. Thunder rolled. Heavenly angels 
sang cantatas in my ears. And I said, beans. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, that's what I said. I said beans. Let's see, there's bean dip. Hot bean dip. Extra spicy. Hot bean dip. And that's when it hit me like a ton of bricks. Corn chips. Don't knock it. The corn chip business is a billion dollar a year industry. <laughs> Poor Lester's working 20 hour days now, running the factory. My biggest problem is, where am I going to find all that cellophane? Oh, and uh, folks, I want you to meet someone. Shirlene, Shirlene, honey, come on out here. Show all these people what a real pretty woman looks like. Honey, all you gotta do is just stand there. Come on, sing it with me. Here we go. I'm singing tractor, woo, tractor. I'm driving all over the hills of Kentucky. Singing tractor. Tractor. I'm driving all over the farm. One more time. In my tractor. Woohoo! Tractor. I'm driving all over the hills of Kentucky. Singing tractor. Tractor. I'm driving all over the farm. Ladies and gentlemen, Miss Shirley McGillicuddy from Cape May County. It's just an actress that we hire, that's all. <laughs> well, that just about does it for this set. I want to thank the principals of this establishment, without whom none of this would have been possible. And a few of you behind the scenes people, I see you. I think you're invisible, don't you? And of course, my mom and dad and the great Lord above for giving me one quarter of an ounce of musical talent. I got to tell you something, you know, folks, is that, you know, say if Mozart, who has sold more records and done more music than anybody else in the whole wide world, he, he received 12 pounds of musical talent. More in our modern times, Lennon and McCartney <laughs> as a songwriting team, between them, they had six pounds, okay? <laughs> Me, I got a quarter pounder trying to make the most of what I got. And with that, Out there, 
Yes, and we both need to whirl it through the air And I make sure that she is breathless Whenever I take her back to her chair Yeah, yeah